welcome you all to our Thursday, May 12th, regular legislative session at 2 p.m. First, we're going to have a public hearing. Uh, County Attorney Rick Mitchell will read off that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Notice of public hearing. <clears throat> Notice is hereby given that the County Legislature of the County of Oswego will meet at the Legislative Chambers, 46 East Bridge Street, Oswego, New York, 13126, at 2 o'clock p.m. on the 12th day of May, 2022. The purpose of holding a public hearing on amending local law number 4 of 2015, a local law permitting and regulating all terrain vehicle operation on certain county roads. The event of seating capacity in the legislative chambers is exceeded. The hearing may be moved to the adjacent county courthouse on East United Street in Oswego. By order of the Oswego County Legislature, dated May 12, 2022, Betsy Sherman Saunders, clerk. Any persons wishing to be heard regarding proposed local law number 4 of 2022, please step forward and state your name. Sir, I'm Thank you. Mr. Chairman, there being no persons wishing to be heard regarding proposed local law number 4 of 2022, I request you declare the public hearing closed at 2.07. Thank you. Well, um, so welcome to the regular meeting. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Michael Yardin. Present. Herbert Yardin. Present. Edward Gilson. Here. David Holes. Here. Roy Rehost and Mark Excuse. John Martino. Here. Frank Bombardo. Present. Paul House. Here. James Weatherup. Here. Mary Ellen Chesbro. Here. Linda <coughs> Lockwood. Here. Richard Klein. Present. Patrick Twist. Here. Stephen Walpole. Here. Nathan Emmons. Here. James Scanlon. Here. Laura Magano. Here. Robert Wilmot. Here. Marie Shaw. Here. Tim Stahl. Here. Noelle Samuelson. Here. James Parasic. Here. Michael Soloway. Here. Mark Greco. Here. Frank Castilia. What you miss it? Mr. Chairman, that's 24 present, one excuse you have for Thank you. Would you please lead us in the invitation? We thank you for this opportunity to serve the people of Oswego County and ask that you offer guidance in helping us to act with character and conviction, that we may begin each day challenged so no answer is left unheard, that we finish each day unified so our answers are not left undone. Let us remember always that our labor, not for ourselves, but for the vision of a better community and that the weight we carry may not always be seen, but will forever be felt. Amen. And could I ask everyone to please remain standing for a moment of silence for all of the fallen police officers as this is police week. Thank you. Thank you. And now the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Thank you. I trust we've read the minutes from the meeting of April 14th and the special meeting on April 22nd. 26th. This is an appropriate motion. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Legislator Castillo. April 14th meeting. <coughs> Corrections to EP3. That was uh, legislator Stahl brought forward a resolution. We had to change the amount in it, so we had to make a motion to amend it. <coughs> That's not listed here. Action. Rich, do we have to have minutes for any action that was taken in the, on the floor? Yes. There's a motion and there's a vote on amending. It's not on there. Just ask the court to be corrected so this in there. Okay. Do you have that written down, sir? I have that written down. Yeah. Anything else? This would be approved subject to that. Yeah, so we're approving subject to that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Carried. Thank you. Uh, moving down to proclamations and recognitions. We can have Dr. Michael Lupoff come forward. Public safety. And the public safety committee. about 
Dr. Nikolaus about his fifth retirement. But, uh, about three and a half years ago when I took over as sheriff, uh, one of the first things I realized was the, uh, he brought to my attention. So the medical facility within the jail was in really bad shape. Uh, we had no written policies. We had, most importantly, we had absolutely no uh, program in place for uh, treatment, drug treatment for inmates that were coming in there. And as a result, it was just this never-ending cycle of people come in, get arrested, get kicked loose, and you're right back within 30 days. Uh, Dr. Newpuff, with his uh, background in drug treatment, uh, agreed to come in and set up the program for us. Uh, our nursing staff was a shambles. It was a pretty constant turnover of nursing staff. Uh, since he's taken over as our medical director, I can tell you that we have a professional nursing staff there now, as, as well as psychologists, and, and uh, drug treatment program has cut down on uh, recidivism. So I just want to take a minute in the public safety committee to uh, thank you for your service to the uh, county and uh, just a, a little token of uh, from the sheriff's office and from the committee of uh, your service to the county. And, and again, he's not leaving us, of course. Like I said, it's fifth retirement. He's uh, going to be going back to farm to run the drug treatment in Mexico. So I'm sure he'll continue the great work there and uh, serving the people in this county and. Uh, especially focusing on those with drug addiction problems. And we know what a problem it is in this county. And uh, this guy right here has been uh, a godsend to turn that trend around here for us. Thank you. Go ahead, you speech. <laughs> if I could just make a couple comments, I won't be very long, I promise. Um, it is been, it's been an honor to serve under Sheriff uh, Hilton and under Sheriff Toomey. Um, they run a tight ship, but everybody who works under them knows that the administration has their backs at all times. I hope that you are um, confident and have uh, good feelings towards the officers, men and women who work in the correctional facility. They are an extremely dedicated group of individuals that I think do a, an extremely wonderful job. Um, most interesting with them is 99% of the time, their job is pretty routine and mundane. But it's that 1% that they always have to be prepared and ready for. Whether it's stopping an attempted suicide, which has happened at least a half a dozen times in the past couple of years. Uh, a severe drug overdose. Uh, psychotic individuals very difficult to treat. And they do it with dignity and respect towards the individuals at all times. And I must say that these folks are colorblind, as far as I can see. It doesn't matter to them whether they're white, black, brown, green, or yellow. They treat people with respect and expect people to treat them the same. So I hope you understand that it has been a, a very difficult position, but these folks do a great job. One other item is I'm very proud of the medical team that we put together. We have LPNs when we couldn't hire RNs, but these folks are extremely dedicated and they function as RNs, although with an LPN pay. I'd like to recognize three individuals for their service and the medical teams especially. First is Mrs. Deborah Vecchio, who's our licensed medical social worker. She's been with us full time for three years. We could not function without her. She's the only one trained to be able to evaluate suicide precautions and take people out of suicide watch. And she works virtually every day without vacation. She's done a wonderful job. Our principal LPN is Mrs. Dina Munger. She took over when our uh, last RN left. She's organized the medical team. She's kept morale uh, up in the medical division, and I think has done a great job with both the medical side and the organizational side. And last is our correctional liaison, Heidi Salazzo. Heidi's smart, she's sassy, she knows all of the inmates in and out, probably their sons and fathers as well. She knows everything that goes on and keeps us well informed of the medical team. 
and I think all these individuals have done a great job. Last but not least is one of my great faults, is believing that no matter how good systems are, they can be better. I think there's things we could do to try to make the community better. I don't really understand why inmates can't keep their health insurance, for example, and why the county taxpayer has to pay for the medical care when it should be insurance. If individuals are on the outside awaiting a line of arraignment, they keep their health insurance. But when they're incarcerated, even though they're just waiting arraignment and haven't been convicted, they lose their health insurance. The other item is, for example, when we had bail reform, we lost the ability to refer people to opioid treatment court. That is very rarely done now because of bail reform and needs to change. The last item is we spend a great deal of time and money getting inmates off of their drugs, treating their mental health issues, which are major problems. We get them feeling good about themselves. We get them to the point where they're stable. But then what do we do? We discharge them, release them back to the same environment, to the same situation that got them involved in the first place. Somehow, that has to change. In any case, I'm very appreciative um, uh, of the award today. Um, it, it's been an interesting experience. Most people have to wait 20 years to get an award like this. Um, maybe with what we went through, it was more like a longer time. <laughs> I am appreciative, and thank you very much. Those who experience sudden illness or injury, and or 
whereas the emergency medical services systems consist of first responders, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, emergency medical dispatchers, physicians, and EMS officers, whereas the members of the emergency medical service teams, whether career or volunteer, engage in many hours of specialized training and continuing education to enhance their life-saving skills, whereas in Oswego County and throughout the nation, emergency medical services display professionalism and dedication during the COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas it is appropriate to recognize the value and accomplishments of emergency medical services provided by designated emergency medical services. We now, therefore, turn to weather up myself and the legislature, on behalf of the legislature in the people of Oswego County, we are hereby proclaim the week of May 15th to the 21st as emergency medical services. This year, the theme of EMS education is rising to the challenge. This theme is incredibly appropriate. During the pandemic, EMS crews not only responded to an increased 911 call volume, but nationwide EMS personnel took on additional duties to support the efforts battling the pandemic. This included many initiatives, especially assisting with testing sites and vaccination clinics. This should come as a surprise to anyone as time and time again, EMS rises to the challenge. Now, our EMS and first responder communities are faced with a new challenge. Our first responders are on the front lines of combating the mental health crisis that our entire nation is facing. This is a problem that will not be solved overnight, but I am confident that the EMS community, alongside the brothers and sisters from law enforcement and the fire service, will continue to rise to the challenge. I would like to thank all the legislators for their support towards the EMS community, especially Chairman Mark Greco and the entire Public Safety Committee, uh, Phil Church, County Administrator, and Chairman Weatherup. Your support does not go unnoticed. The EMS community in Oswego County is a very tight knit group, and I am confident that as a team, there is nothing they cannot fix. Thank you. We have the Human Services Committee come forward along with Sarah addresses the issues of exploitations, neglect, and abuse of older adults. 
and adapt the services to the needs of the Native American elders. And whereas we recognize the value of community engagement and service in helping older Americans remain healthy and active while giving back to others. And whereas our community can provide opportunities to enrich the lives of individuals of all ages by promoting and engaging in activity, wellness, and social inclusion, emphasizing home and community-based services that support independent living, ensuring community members of all ages benefit from the contributions and experiences of older adults. Now, therefore, I, James Weather, Chairman of the Oswego County Legislature, on behalf of the entire legislature, do hereby proclaim May 2022 to be Older Americans Month and encourage every resident to take time this month to celebrate older adults and the people who serve and support them as powerful and vital individuals who greatly contribute to the community. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say each, each May we do celebrate older Americans month. This year the theme is Age My Way. And I want to thank the legislature, county administration, human services committee for allowing the office for the aging to put programs and services and support in place that allow our elderly to age the way they want in the Oswego County. So thank you all. Any introduction to visitors? Thank you. Uh, public speakers and resolutions of the day. <coughs> um, thank you. We have Marie Hudson. She come forward. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Maria Hudson. I started work at the Nine Mile Point Nuclear Station in 2004. So I've spent the majority of my career working at one of the upstate New York nuclear power plants. Um, on behalf of our over 2,000 New York nuclear employees, I just want to express our appreciation for the resounding support that we've had since 2015. Oswego County, upstate energy jobs, especially Gary Tove, uh, the IDA, Oswego and Mexico schools, and more have always acted swiftly to preserve nuclear plants and their environmental and economic benefits. Whenever something comes up that needs attention, we call it getting the band back together. That's what Gary and I and our team joke about, getting the band back together. Um, so most recently, we got the band back together when the Climate Action Council hearings started. Um, so back in 2019, not to bore you too much, but back in 2019, um, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act was established in New York. And that set extremely aggressive climate goals for the state, but we didn't have a path forward to get there. So enter the Climate Action Council. They've spent two years coming up with a draft scoping plan, and they released that plan this year for us to look at, us as in the public, and they've been holding about a dozen public meetings across the state. Uh, the good news about this Climate Action Council is that they did include nuclear energy in their draft scoping plan. So we wanted to make sure that the nuclear language was evident in the final scoping plan. So we gathered up all of our supporters again, Oswego County, UEJ, IDA, the schools, everybody got back together in labor and did so quickly and attended public meetings to make their comments heard. Uh, in particular, Phil Church, um, and Gary and Bob Wilmont um, all went up to ESF, to so meet ESF. Not the easiest task to park and walk up that hill and wait a couple of hours to talk in front of a big group. So thank you so much for that. The turnout across the upstate hearings in Syracuse, Albany, and Buffalo was extremely impressive. Um, I was in Albany last week and heard multiple comments from Climate Action Council committee members, uh, just other members that were on the calls. Um, people that have heard these calls have come up to me and said, I can't believe the nuclear support. What an amazing community. They really get it and want to keep those plants there. So now we are turning our attention to the written comments. And that's where this resolution comes in. 
We have until June 10th to submit any additional evidence uh, that would help keep the nuclear plants in the final scoping plan. And that's what I'm hoping that we will do here today. And uh, again, just want to thank everybody one more time, um, Chairman Jim Wetherup, uh, Phil Church, Dave Turner. Um, we have a really outstanding team here in Oswego County, and we cannot thank you enough for all you've done to preserve our nuclear assets. Thanks. Is there any other public speakers on resolutions of the day? There being none, if you'll indulge me for a short moment, Mr. Twist. We're going to move now before resolutions to the state of the county address, which hopefully. government employees across all our departments who carry out our mission and serve our residents with professionalism every day. I'd also like to specifically thank all our department heads for overseeing our outstanding employees and guiding us through another uniquely stressful year. I'd be remiss not to recognize my fellow legislators and elected officials, including Majority Leader Nate Emmons, Sheriff Don Hilton, Clerk, County Clerk Terry Wilbur, Treasurer Kevin Gardner, and District Attorney Greg Oaks. You represent our county well, and I'm appreciative of all your continued partnership. I'd also like to thank County Administrator Phil Church, who understands the necessary balance between the county's obligations to its citizens and the need to deliver services in a cost-effective manner. Before we get into the state of the county, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our brothers and sisters across the globe fighting for freedom and democracy in Ukraine. Our thoughts are with men and women who stayed to fight against an unjust invasion and the millions forced to flee their homes. Back here at home, the state of our county is strong. Sweden County and the nation is coming out of an unprecedented two years that presented some of the most significant challenges in recent memory. We saw the spirit of togetherness in the community shine through as neighbors helped one another through trying times. Police week. <laughs> Proud of the work our county department did. We distributed personal protective equipment, at-home tests, and vaccines by the thousands to those who wanted them. Our health emergency management and many other departments, along with other essential private sector employees and hundreds of community volunteers, help guide us through the COVID-19 pandemic and ensure that our respective services continue. Our health department answered nearly 40,000 phone calls on the COVID-19 hotline over the last two years and administered almost 23,000 vaccines, including homebound residents and hard to reach populations. They also conducted case investigations, followed up with the tens of thousands of residents who tested positive or were close contacts with those infected. Those employees should be proud of their work, and I want to thank them for working long hours they put in to protect our residents while dealing with constantly changing directives and guidance from the state and federal partners. But it was not just our health department either. We continued to provide meals to our seniors, issued legal documents and licenses, handled solid waste and maintained roadways throughout the past two years as all county departments remained open and served our residents. We were not always perfect. But county government responded during tough times, continuing to provide essential services, educating residents, and helping us move forward despite the threat of the deadly virus. As we reflect on the struggles of the pandemic years, it is also important that we recognize the continued improvement and growth that occurred under these conditions. Despite the many challenges before us, our Sheriff's Department was able to enhance the activities of the Drug Task Force, expand the school resource officer program into two more schools and to drive an expansion of the Oswego County 
Regional Police Academy. The Treasurer's Office was also focused on their continuous improvement plan and they added new online services to help residents and businesses have enhanced 24-7 access to many of the services and programs they manage. They are but a few examples as each department has its own unique success stories, but suffice to say, we have found ways to create opportunity from adversity as we stay focused on our respective missions to serve you. The county legislature, for its part, allowed $250,000 to local residents through the restaurant recovery program to aid the hardest hit among our small business community and help our residents. The program was a major success, injecting cash into our struggling small business community and providing residents with more than 5,100 vouchers. To combat worker shortages in the medical field, this legislature also designated $500,000 for a school of health one of the area's largest employers and a critical provider of care in our community. Healthcare facilities and organizations are facing critical shortage of workers and the funds will assist Oswego Health in continuing to provide accessible, quality care in Oswego County. These are the types of meaningful initiatives that will help our businesses get back on their feet and prosper and we expect to present additional support for a wide variety of entities at the June meeting of this body. It is also appropriate at this time that we thank our businesses and the community for their efforts and sacrifice over these last few years. I want to thank them all for stepping up to the plate, showing resilience through the pandemic restrictions and the shutdowns, and before that, the economic impacts of lakeshore flooding. Those were the good old days. These last four years have indeed been trying times, and our business community has shown strength throughout to not only survive, but thrive in the face of adversity. The county sales tax revenues continue to grow in 2021, increasing almost 5% from the previous year and close to 9% from pre pandemic levels in 2019. I'm also happy to report that so far, these trends appear to be continuing into 2022. Strong sales tax revenues demonstrate the strength of our business community, and since they are also paid by visitors, they help soften the local tax burden on our residents. We must ensure that we're ready as a community to continue this momentum and move on from the challenges and losses of the past several years into a new era of prosperity. The pandemic took a toll on all of us. While it is important that we learn from the past two years, our leadership team is looking forward, not back. We believe the worst of this crisis and disruption to daily life are not behind us. The coronavirus may still be part of our lives, but what matters now is how we move forward. We will stay focused on the future and work to reduce the physical and financial burdens on everyone who chooses to live, work, and raise a family here. As part of these efforts, we must diversify our economy to be more resilient in the face of future challenges. That means improving our infrastructure to help existing businesses grow and to make our area a destination for prospective job seekers and creators. We must make it easier for companies to do business in Squibo County and to create more job opportunities that allow our young folks to build a career here and attract new residents. As part of the 2022 budget, the Squibo County Legislature created the Office of Strategic Initiatives to help further our economic and infrastructure objectives with the help of more than $20 million in federal pandemic relief funding. Our team has solicited input from stakeholders throughout our communities, including department heads, local municipalities, business leaders, schools, and the nonprofit community to determine the best investments for our county's future. We are in the process of evaluating potential projects and a plan is expected to be submitted to the legislature later this year for review and consideration. We've been carefully moving forward with this once in a lifetime opportunity and plan to make investments that will strengthen our communities for generations in areas such as childcare, affordable and accessible broadband service, 
and other critical infrastructure. Our lives rely more and more on web-based services and expanding broadband capabilities to deliver high-speed internet access to more of Oswego County will help us remain competitive on a global scale. Improving our transportation networks as well as upgrading and expanding our waste and wastewater systems in the county are also potential measures that have risen to the top of our priorities. The COVID-19 pandemic intensified some of the challenges facing our county, and we must come together to confront these issues. Childcare has long been a barrier for many of our moms and dads to enter and remain in the workforce. These last two years have made it clear how big of a challenge it truly is throughout our communities. The lack of available child care and its high cost, where is it, where it is available, leaves force some workers to stay home. So we must find ways to make child care services more accessible and affordable to bolster our workforce. Infrastructure is critical to growing our county. It is imperative that we take a comprehensive look at our needs and the ability to address them if we want to be successful in spurring economic development and readying ourselves for the future. Infrastructure projects are expensive and often time consuming, but crumbling infrastructure can deter prospective businesses and residents from moving to our area. So we must do what it takes to maintain and improve our infrastructure if we hope to position the county it is job creators for future growth. <laughs> our government must be responsive to our citizens' needs while maintaining responsible spending to ensure our communities remain affordable. Our goals have long been and continue to be focused on adopting reasonable budgets that balance our citizens' needs with sound fiscal management. Oswego County finances are strong as a result. We weathered the 2008 financial crisis, and we're now overcoming the effects of two years of shutdowns and restrictions. Despite the continued pressure of unfunded mandates and costs shifting from Albany and Washington, our county is on a solid financial footing, and later this year, we will once again be debt-free. <laughs> Through the adoption of the 2022 budget, the county legislature approved a 7% tax cut for our property owners while also restoring millions of dollars to various reserve funds. That tax cut followed by a nearly 3% reduction in the 2021 budget, creating the lowest county tax rate in more than a decade, providing many homeowners and businesses continued savings on their property tax bills. In addition to cutting taxes, last month the legislature passed a pair of resolutions that provide partial property tax exemptions to low-income senior households for those with qualifying disabilities. The last two years have shown us the importance of taking care of those in our communities who are vulnerable, and these measures will help make Oswego County more affordable for many on fixed incomes and help ensure they're enabled to stay in their homes. Sound fiscal management has allowed us to make progress in these areas while making significant investments to county government facilities and services. We will soon begin renovating the Bunner Street facility for our new public defender's office, and we have reestablished an in-house purchasing department to streamline our procurement in a way that is more responsive to the needs of our departments, vendors, and residents. In addition to a more efficient, productive purchasing department, our county clerk's office reported that some hard work and innovation by his staff resulted in a 15% increase in productivity in 2021, and most recently allowed them to reopen the Fulton branch of the motor vehicle offices. One of my guiding principles as an elected official has always been to carefully protect taxpayer money, and I believe each and every one of my colleagues on this legislature feels the same way. On that front, we have been successful, bringing the tax rate down nearly 30% since the early 2000s, from a high rate of 960 per thousand in 2004 to $6.95 in the current year. We've done that by carefully balancing the needs of our residents and the cost of doing business here. We will continue our work to reduce the final financial burden on our taxpayers while providing critical services. The best way to reduce costs for future residents is to grow our tax base 
and create jobs in our communities. And there are opportunities in front of you and us to do that. <coughs> we will work to make strategic, impactful, long-term investments in our communities, making Oswego County a better place for everyone. Another major way we've been able to increase our revenue is attracting more visitors to the county. Despite the pandemic, tourism activity has nearly doubled over the last decade, supporting new jobs and investment in our small business community. <coughs> Efforts to establish a national marine sanctuary along the shores of Lake Ontario are ongoing and could be nearing completion as soon as later this year, after seven years of hard work from local, state, and federal partners. This multi-county effort would preserve the vast underwater historic resources, mostly shipwrecks, that dot the Lake Ontario shoreline without negatively impacting our sport fishing and other recreational assets. If successful, this would be one of only just a dozen marine sanctuaries in the world. Such a development should bolster the hospitality and travel industry, bringing thousands more visitors to the area and boosting sales and bed tax revenues across the region. A similar effort is underway to designate the Fort Ontario Military Reservation as a national park. This would help to showcase more than two centuries of military installations in the only World War II refugee shelter in the United States. If realized, this would create synergy with a national marine sanctuary and make Oswego County a major tourist destination at a time when we're also seeing increased investments in our downtowns and waterfront areas. These are the types of big picture effects we must and will pursue without forgetting about the natural resources and assets that have powered our county for decades. Our area is rich in history and natural beauty. We have much to offer and we must share our story with others. <laughs> One of the darkest points of the past year was the tragedy that occurred in May 2021. The death of 17-year-old Jordan Brooks is a heartbreaking case of child neglect and abuse. Through the arrest of his parents, and a testament to the hard work of the men and women of the Sheriff's Department, we must examine what happened and do what we can to make Oswego County a safer place for our children and other vulnerable residents. We will not forget Jordan's death. <clears throat> and we will do everything in our power to ensure something like this never happens. As such, this legislature approved a full investigation of the Department of Social Services handling of this case to ensure our child protective services are doing everything possible to stop child abuse and neglect. Child abuse occurs far too often in our county and throughout the world. We must examine the underlying causes of the generational problem and attack it at its roots. Our review of social services and the related systems may or may not reveal concrete solutions to these issues. And it may be just the beginning of what could be a long and hard road, but it's a road we must go down. And we do so with a hope and desire that will lead us down a path of continuous improvement as we deliver those critical services. In closing, you know, that's the part you wanted to hear. <laughs> Okay, Baxter, in closing, I'd like again to re-emphasize my confidence in this legislature, the county employees, and our department heads. Together, we will continue to provide the people of Oswego County with a responsible, efficient, and effective government. We have much more work to do on the issues facing our county, so let's leave here committed, working together and finishing the year strong. It's an honor to serve as chairman, and thank you all for the opportunity. I look forward to a positive and productive year. God bless you all. God bless Oswego County. God bless the United States of America. <laughs> I'm only still standing up because I can't move this myself. <laughs>
Moving now to resolutions and motions. Government Courts and Consumer Affairs, Resolution GC1 by Legislator Holt. Mr. Chairman, I'll offer this resolution. Urgence adoption. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution supporting inclusion of upstate nuclear power plants in New York State's Climate Action Council scoping plan and extension of the Zero Emissions Credit Program. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, they currently produce 44% of the New York Zero Carbon Emission Electricity, representing 3,300 megawatts. Uh, they uh, facilitate contributing more than $3 billion to New York's economy and uh, pay $144 billion in the annuals, uh, state and local taxes. This will have to be amended with a handout. Yes, we do have, it's been distributed to all the legislators, we do have an amendment. So. Motion to uh, any discussion on the amendment? Motion. Yeah, make a motion for the amendment first. So moved. Second. No. Okay. Any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, this 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excused on the amendment. Thank you. Back to the original resolution as amended. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, that's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excused. Thank you. Moving now to Public Safety Committee, Legislator Greco, Resolution PS1. Chairman, I offer this resolution to recommend its adoption. So clerk, please read the heading. Resolution awarding professional services contract, comprehensive emergency management plan, CEMP. Yeah, this is just updating the plan and study. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, that's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excused. Thank you. Resolution PS2 by Legislator Greco. Chairman, I call this resolution for urgent adoption. Will the clerk please read the heading? A resolution fixing time and place for public hearing relative to a proposed County of Oswego Local Law Number 5 of the year 2022, <laughs> establishing non-consensual towing and storage fees for towing services dispatched by the County. Yeah, this is a law that's been a long time in the process of making and completing at the request of 911 law enforcement uh, towing. Uh, we're trying to set the date for the public hearing. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, that's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excuse. Thank you. Moving now to the Human Services Committee by Legislator Karasek, Resolution HS1. Mr. Chairman, fellow legislation, I have present the following resolution for your consideration. Clerk, please. Resolution awarding professional services contract RFP 22-YB-001 Camp Hollis winterization. So this is a program that we've talked about several times, we've talked about the committee, and we're getting to the point now that we need to put it together for winterization. That would allow Camp Hollis to become a year-round uh, use. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, that's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excuse. Thank you. Resolution HS2 by Legislator Press. Mr. Chairman, fellow legislators, I present the following resolution for your consideration. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution awarding professional services contract RFP 22-OFA-001 Personal Emergency Response Services. So this is a uh, request for a proposal for a vendor to provide personal emergency response services. Uh, really what it is. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, a lot of explanation. Any other discussion? Legislator to see it. This says annually. We will be voting on this again every year. Is this a five-year contract or just a one-year deal? Mr. Personal emergency response service. It says annually in the resolution, but I haven't seen it before, so that's my man. I think the contract. there are contracts that are being made with. Yeah. 
I'm not sure that that comes up every year because I don't know. Where do you where where do you see the word annual? Is it in the resolution or in the annual memo? In the resolution, it's an annual. No, no, that's that's the part, that's how much it costs each year. Oh, each year, yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of yeah. Okay. All right. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, there's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excused. Thank you. Resolution HS3 by Legislator Carrasco. Mr. Chairman, fellow legislators, I present the following resolution for your consideration. Will the clerk please read the heading. Resolution authorizing creation of two positions and deletion of one position in the Department of Social Services legal team. So this really comes down to trying to assist DSS in all the legal work that they have to do. So this would be adding a couple of paralegals and it would allow that background and all that heavy lift that has to be done in order to prepare a case for family court. So the anticipation is that we could move cases through family court as quick as they were able to schedule them. <coughs> Thank you. Any other discussion? Legislator to see it. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to amend this resolution. Uh, I want to amend it and take out the deletion of one position. Make a motion now to amend it. Motion to amend. Second motion to shot. Any discussion on the amendment? Legislator to see. Uh, I'd like to ask a few questions if I could, either yourself or Phil or somebody from DSS. In the 2022 budget, how many attorneys did we budget for and why? You can make this five attorneys in the budget. And the reason we budgeted for five was as the department's request based on the workload. Okay, so has the workload gone down? Yeah, I don't know. Pardon? No. The SS says no. All right. So the reason I'm asking is because I know that in the Cornell report, they did state that we should increase our legal help which is why I leave asking to leave in the two uh, paralegals because that is needed. But with the caseload going up, and right now the caseload on those existing lawyers and our request to try to get lawyers is because of salary and workload. If we eliminate trying to get a lawyer, then I say that we're going to put more workload on the existing lawyers. And with what's going on right now, I think we need as much help as we can get. I agree with the two paralegals, Mr. Chairman, because that is needed, okay? And, but I do feel that we need to leave the one position in there and keep looking for another attorney, another lawyer. Uh, the money, we can work out at some point in time if we do, you know, we do hire somebody. But I'm asking right now that we leave those in there. DSS and the lawyers need as much help as we can get, and you stated in your state of the you know, state of the county address that we'll do whatever is necessary to assure that things come out right. And I think that's what we need to right now. We need the lawyers, we need as much help as we can get. So therefore I'm putting this forward and I would like a roll call vote on the please, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, this resolution was uh, brought forward by our folks at DSS, part of a larger strategy they are putting together regarding their legal services team. Uh, this is kind of like step one for them, and they will continue uh, to review their needs as, as necessary. So, I don't believe there's a need for an amendment uh, to this. Uh, again, it's just a part of their strategy. I'm sure the minority leader could spend some time with folks at DSS and learn more about their strategy um, at a different date. Thank you. Legislator Martino passes. Legislator Castillo. 
that, that being said, Mr. Chairman, I would like somebody from DSS to explain to me why they want to get rid of one of the positions that they had budgeted for because they needed it because of the workload. And the workload has increased due to the fact of the death and all the caseloads that are coming in. So we've increased it, but now you want to decrease one of the attorneys. So I would like to know from somebody from DSS why they agreed to eliminate one of those positions. Mr. Chairman, I mean, the minority leader has more than enough opportunity prior to today to answer has all these questions that he has. Point of order, Mr. Chairman, he's got to, he's got to get to the point, not, not attack me. I'm not attacking okay. you. I'm just simply it's stating okay. there is a time and place for those questions. No, this is not the time for those. He, there is a human services committee that he can attempt to dive into these questions related to this particular resolution. Absolutely. And I would add that is my understanding from that committee meeting that this is part of an overall strategy and they, in effect, have a standing request for an attorney. Yes, sir. These are public meetings. Where are the votes to attend? Yes, they are. Legislator Castillo. Mr. Chairman, I was elected to ask questions and hold things accountable. I, I come here today, I can ask any question I want, anytime I want, about any issue or any resolution. I'm sorry. Legislator House. I'd like to call a question. Call. Thank you. Question's been called. Roll call vote on the amendment. Michael Yerdin. No. Herbert Yerdin. No. Edward Gilson. No. David Holes. No. Roy Rehill has been marked excused. John Martino. No. Frank Lombardo. No. Paul House. No. James Weatherup. Here. Her. No. Mary <laughs> No. Mary Chesma. No. Linda Lockwood. No. Richard Klein. No. Patrick Twist. No. Stephen Walpole. No. Nathan Emmons. No. James Scanlon. No. Lori Magano. No. Robert Wilmot. No. Marie Shad. Yes. Tim Stahl. No. Noel Samuelson. No. James Karasik. No. <coughs> Michael Soloway. No. Mark Greco. No. Frank Castilia. Yes. Mr. Chairman, that's two in favor, 22 opposed, and one excused. Thank you. Back to the original amendment, Legislator Chris. So I still have a comment on that, and, and uh, Mr. Evans. Kind of reference to that. And I do want to direct a comment to Mr. Casilia. You are right as a legislator, you have a right to speak up in this body. Um, the, the whole program idea is we need to come up with an immediate reaction to try to move cases through family court. Um, a lot of that background work takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. Paralegals can get that work done for us. As mentioned in a comment, we always have the opportunity to put another lawyer into DSS. We run the budget. If they come back and they say they need another lawyer and they can demonstrate the need for that, I don't think they're going to get a lot of opposition from us. We all understand the issue. Uh, the issue at the moment is getting a lot of this paperwork to move so that we can start moving the process forward to see what works and what does not work for us as a government. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, that's 22 in favor, two opposed, and one excused. Thank you. Resolution HS4 by Legislator Carrasco. It's easier for me to stay standing. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'd like to introduce the following resolution for your consideration. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution authorizing budget modification, Department of Social Services, to transfer funds into services, additional hours, and overtime. And this is for the legislature, so I admit it. Uh, this is money that needs to be used for overtime. Again, I think it's part of the program plan of how to move things forward, uh, take care of the needs that are over there. Uh, this does come out of uh, our appropriated fund balance. Uh, there's a reason for that shuffle, it, it, logistically, for the county. This is much more beneficial than trying to analyze or see what they haven't used in payroll and go through that process. So this, this creates an immediate answer to an issue. 
Okay. Any other discussion? Senator Castillo. I'm reading this over and summary on the back. I see where eight caseworkers have uh, vacated the area in the past 30 days. Uh, is there an explanation or any idea why these eight caseworkers have left in the past 30 days? Well, there could be any number of reasons. We're going through a revamp of our exit uh, interview process. So okay. We could get back to you on that. Okay, well, the, the reason I'm asking the question is uh, I do understand, my understanding is that uh, the caseworkers are not allowed to receive overtime. Is that correct? No, they do. Yeah, they get overtime. Uh, this is what I was told. I was told that they had to take uh, time off. They had to take comp time. They didn't get paid overtime. Okay. But what I, what I, the reason I get to this is we are right now we're budgeting overtime payments in this in this resolution. Right. Well, that's why I'm asking because I was being told that they don't, they couldn't get overtime. And that's from that's from the past case that left. All right. But now, what you're doing is you're taking people that work 35 hours a week, and you're adding five hours to that. So now they've got 40 hours a week to do the same amount of work that they used to do in 35 hours a week. But they have to work over 40 hours to get overtime, or now or not? Yes, Is that the case. Okay. So they're overworked and underpaid, and we're losing people. And we're going to add the number of hours that they have to work in order to get overtime. And I just think you're going to see more people leaving because of this, <laughs> not not gaining people because you're adding five hours to their work week. I'm sorry. So my understanding is you'll be doing the business. No, no, I'm not okay, I'm just I'm just I'm just up the points, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe that there may be some there may be some issues with the union and some of the people who are within the union need to speak to the representatives about it, and that could possibly cure some of the issues that they have. Thank you. Any other discussion? Let's later on. Well, Mr. Chairman, I guess I would like to point out that it's not that they're not getting paid for that additional five. Not asking them to pump out to 40 hours per week at the same same salary that we are at. So uh, I'm not sure if this would impact the uh, employees' pension or not. But just to be clear, it's not that we're not paying our caseworkers the extra five hours plus additional overtime. On top of that, this is a three, this is kind of a three-month projection. This is kind of gets through the next three months. That uh, has a whole lot of time uh, for our DSS staff to recover uh, and to hire uh, and back up those. Thank you. Legislator Casillo. My understanding is caseworkers are hourly. Are they hourly or salary? Somebody got an answer? They're, they're, I believe they're hourly. They're in CSCA. Uh, they are budgeted, they are budgeted at a salaried amount. They are eligible, always have been, for additional hours and overtime. Uh, we, we budget that at the beginning of the year. Uh, and if they run out of overtime, we do budget amendments like this to add more in. And they needed it this year because of the number of agents. I'm just saying that we should, you know, pay them a higher wage and increase their uh, benefits. And instead of increasing their hours, and maybe we'll be able to hold people, because I understand that there's a few people that have left just in the last day or two at DSS in the case we're I know we're losing them to other counties, and I don't like that. I said since my first year that I was here, I said we should equal our pay to other counties. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, that's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excuse. Thank you. Resolution HS5 by Legislator Correct. Mr. Chairman, fellow legislators, I present the following resolution for your consideration. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution authorizing the County of Oswego to accept the note donation of materials and labor from OLE, Organization of Latino Employees, James A. Fitzpatrick, NPP, Constellation, Camp Hollis Cabin Renovations. So, this is all good. Um, it is a bit unusual. 
Uh, but it's a, it's a great effort to try to improve things out of Camp Hollis. Uh, this organization is going to be donating uh, material and labor to uh, help with the cameras. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Thank Chairman, that's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excuse. Thank you. Moving now to Economic Development and Planning Committee, Resolution EP1, by Legislator Stock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I bring this resolution forward and I urge its adoption. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution designating the certifying officer and environmental responsibility certifications for all Oswego County Community Development Block Grant programs, specifically 864-CEHR34-21, Oswego County Local CDBG Program Income Administration Plan 2022 and NYS CDBG CARES Farm Worker Housing Program. Uh, so we've talked about this a couple of months in a row now. We've got an application into the CDBG uh, for some grant funds up to a million dollars. Uh, as part of the requirement to apply for this, we've got to designate a certifying officer. That's what this application or this resolution does. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, before we vote, I would add that was almost as long as a heading as the state of the county act. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, there's 20, 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excuse. Thank you. Thank you. Moving now to the Health Committee, Resolution HE1 by Legislator Evans. Oh, you're the, you're the one. Legislator Carrasco. I'll defer to the Thank you, Mr. Evans. I'm back. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, fellow legislators, I present the following resolution for your consideration. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution authorizing budgetary modification health department rollover of 2021 grant funds. So this is a real simple process. When we did the uh, reorganization and restructure of the health department, uh, we've kind of created a different department called Public Health Emergency Planning Department. And so we're taking the money from the grants from the old department, uh, which was uh, Public Health Education, and moving it into this. So it's just moving the money into the right time. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, it's 24. In favor, zero opposed, and one excuse. Thank you. Moving now to infrastructure facilities and technology, Legislator Walpole, Resolution IT1. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I for the following resolution, or just adopt. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution authorizing execution of an intermunicipal inter agreement between the City of Oswego and the County of Oswego for leachate treatment and sludge disposal. Yes, Mr. Chairman, just looking to continue on with our successful agreement with the City of Oswego. Thank you. Any discussion? Legislator Castillo. Mr. Chairman, when this was originally voted on five years ago, this agreement brought forward, I argued it on the floor then. In regards to I represent the county of Oswego, it's true, but I also represent the city of Fulton. And at that time, the city of Fulton was going to lose somewhere in the neighborhood of $250,000 revenue plus the sludge that they have to pay to send up here. So it was a big hit for a city that was reeling in losses. What this legislature has to understand is we have two municipalities in this county. One that right now is very much flourishing and one that is still on their heels and fighting. I, and the understanding that the city of Fulton was not even asked to come to the table to talk about this. With that being said, Mr. Chairman, I will not be voting in favor of this. We have to look at both municipalities whenever we do this in five years, if any of us are still here, and ask them to come to the table and see if they can do something better. We have to help everyone. This isn't a one city town. I would offer okay. five years, you'll come back. Uh, I don't think I will. 
I just never want to be in the grave, but I guess I'm determined as I could. Prior to this agreement, a little over five years ago, as this uh, as day is dated, we constantly had monthly issues regarding the EJ and the recovery facility. At the time, the city of Fulton was handling it, the way it's disposed of, through the wastewater treatment as this is the city is dated. Uh, they were at their limits, and like I stated, there was constantly issues there, and some of them almost forcing us to shut down. Uh, that being said, it got to the point where I believe they were at their, their limit, correct? Uh, the information that I got, sir, was no, they weren't. Uh, okay, I, you know, I know what you, I understand right. what you're saying, right. and I had heard that, but I talked to people that were in the facility working at the time. And they said no, they weren't at their limits. There was issues with the ammonia levels and the leachate, but there always is, sir. Understood. I received a call that we it's brought over there via anchor truck. And they were at their limits, it was hit and miss, and this is not an ongoing issue. But when I had received the call, we were at the time where we were going to disagree. And at that current time, we were on the verge of actually shutting down the energy recovery and so And brought to my attention that the city of Oak did have some issues regarding their waste treatment facility and that they were looking to upgrade. At the time, we were, uh, I think it cost the county right around $195,000 at that time. Approximately $195,000 we were giving to the city of Oak. And like I stated, we continuously had issues whether or not we were at the limits or not. It was even proposed that the county put in some machinery and some technology to reduce the leachate being produced at the energy recovery facility in order to keep within the city of Fulton's limits. Well, that being said, that was a $2.5 million proposal. And the leachate at the time, there was only a very few places where you could dispose of it. We had a choice, so I was told we had a choice between the city of Fulton or trucking it to water. To truck that material to water now was obviously very costly. At that time, I was also notified that our cost of disposal was going to go from approximately $195,000 to $250,000. At this point, obviously, that was going to be an impact to us. Well, I myself was at the energy recovery facility discussing this. And when I pulled out of there, it dawned on me, well, obviously, the city of Oswego. The city of Oswego had a newly elected mayor. As I, re as I pulled out, I contacted Mayor Barlow explained them where we were at and if they would be able to help us in this, uh, our situation with the leaching. Before I even got all the way down to 481, he actually contacted me back and made some phone calls and not only could they take it, but he could expedite it to get it there that following Monday so we didn't, in fact, have to shut the facility down as we were running out of anchor space to hold this. And during our talk, he brought up that they were paying approximately $175,000 a year to dispose of their sludge. These things were very close in numbers, so we had come up with this here, this uh, agreement, where we're taking their sludge and they're taking care of our leachate issue. They bent over backwards to help us on very short notice in order to accommodate us, and I just want to make note that over five years, I've had zero complaints about anything any way, shape, form regarding limits. The city of Oswego kind of came through for us on short notice. It's worked. It's worked out great. And in my opinion, if it's not broken, no thanks. Thank you. Legislator Cross. Yeah, I was, I was going to cover a little bit of that, but also in conjunction with that, one of the issues with the sludge was we were actually considering spreading chemicals over that when we took it to the landfill. And that was very cost prohibitive. Uh, I would I would say that you know if the city of Fulton uh, has upgraded, I know they're talking about another one, and they meet the EPA requirement. I think it's EPA. Uh, they meet those requirements, then then I think that that should be a conversation. I absolutely agree with Frank on that. That uh, you know they they originally did it for years. Uh, they were out of compliance. It wasn't a, a question. We were told uh, that's not the process that's going to work. They're going to be in trouble, and you got to find another place to put it. Uh, and that's how, and then as Mr. Wallach said, said that, that the conversation then went that the other direction. So, 
there's, there's a lot of little fingers that were in that that, that involved not just the truck was watered down, possible chemicals that we had to spread on it if we kept it, um, and the, the city of Oswego wasn't compliant. Thank you. Any other discussion? Legislator Castillo. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the deal that was made with I understand. And I understand it was, a, it was a good deal. Okay? That isn't what I'm you know, asking for. Okay? I've spoken with uh, the elected officials from the city of Baltimore. They were a little just thought that they weren't able to come to the table to even try to <coughs> make a similar deal. Okay? So all I'm asking is five years. Anybody's here, please remember you got two cities here. And maybe they can make the same deal. That's all I'm asking. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Chairman, that's 23 in favor, one opposed, and one excused. Thank you. Resolution 19 2 by Legislator Walpole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have the following resolution. Please, so, please read the heading. Resolution authorizing the implementation and funding of 100% of the costs of a transportation project which may be eligible for federal aid and or state aid or reimbursement from Bridge New York funds. Yes, Mr. Chairman, it is as written. This particular one is the Maple Ave Bridge. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, that's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excused. Thank you. Resolution IT3 by Legislator Walpole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. After the following resolution, is the document. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution authorizing budget modification for the highway department to transfer funds from insurance recovery fund to highway expense. Yes, Mr. Chairman, once again, this is uh, moving the funds from the insurance recovery back <coughs> into the highway expense in the amount of $2,578.36 from the vehicles that from the dealer. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, there's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excused. Thank you. Resolution IT4 by Legislator Walpole. Yes, Mr. Chairman, off the following resolution, it's adoption. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution authorizing budget modification with the highway department to transfer sale of equipment into highway and street equipment. Yes, Mr. Chairman, as we know, for a lot of our equipment goes off to public auction. We try and stay in contact with our town highways to see if it's something they were interested in and this is something they had bid on. And this, they had bid on in order to bid $30,000 and selling them. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Vote. Mr. Chairman, it's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excused. Thank you. Resolution IT5 by Legislator Walpole. Yes, Mr. Chairman, after the following resolution, and third this adoption. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution authorizing expenditure for capital reserve number 21, buildings renovations. Yes, Mr. Chairman, as stated, at our at the Oswego Courthouse, there has been an assessment done and this photos. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, that's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excused. Thank you. Resolution IT6 by Legislator Walpole. Mr. Chairman, after the following resolution, the Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution amending capital project number 72, DMV expansion, renovation, and closing capital project number 89, airport site development. This is residual underway tobacco funds is closing out one account. So they left over five dollars and eighty-three cents. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Mr. Chairman, that's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excuse. Thank you. Resolution IT7 by Legislator Walpole. Mr. Chairman, I'll provide a resolution. Urge the adoption. Will the clerk please read the heading? A resolution adopting County of Oswego Local Law Number 4 of 2022 
entitled Local Law Amending Local Law Number 4, 2015, a local law permitting and regulating all-terrain vehicle ATV operation on certain county roads. As you know, this is an annual thing. We are going up some of our roads for ATVs, the designated roads. And this helps ensure that the proper time is going to be Very good. Good. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, there's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excuse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Moving now to Finance and Personnel Committee, Legislator Martino, Resolution FP1. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have this resolution and this adoption. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution awarding professional services contract RFP 22-PR-002, Auctioneer Services. This is just what it says. It means awarding the contract to Auctioneer Services for the county uh, property tax auction. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, there's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excuse. Thank you. Resolution FP2 by Legislator Martino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have this resolution and urge its adoption. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution authorizing capital project closures and transfer of project balances. This is what it says also, proposing uh, any capital projects that were left over or finished and transferring the monies back to uh, fund balance. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, there's 24 in favor, zero opposed, and one excuse. Thank you. Resolution FB3 by Legislator Martino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have this resolution and urge its adoption. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution authorizing and ratifying a memorandum of understanding by and between the County of Oswego and the Oswego County Professionals Association. Yes, this is uh, an ongoing memorandum of understanding between Oswego County and Aqua that started last year because of the pandemic. This is a, an extension and continuation for on call premiums. Uh, this will go in and stay until fact until December 31st, 2022. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chairman, this is 24 in favor. Zero opposed to one excuse. Mr. Chairman, I make the motion to lay the rules. Do we have a second? Second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor of waiving the rules for a resolution uh, FC4. I'd like to uh, clarify waiving the rules for FP4 only. Correct. Yes, correct. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Chairman, that's 23 in favor, one opposed, and one excuse for waiving the rules. Thank you. Back to resolution FP4, Legislator Martino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have this resolution and urge its adoption. Will the clerk please read the heading? Resolution amending the Swingle County Purchasing Policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our uh, purchasing department has gone through and uh, revamped, I guess you could say, brought up to be the uh, county purchasing policy. The policy that we started with was old and outdated uh, from when we did business as a purchasing department years back. Now that it's back in house and they get a chance to see what needs to be done, they've gone through and uh, changed and gone through the policies as necessary uh, with the uh, input from the Administrator Church, myself, the Chairman. Um, I urge this adoption. Thank you. Any other discussion? Legislator Castillo. Change number four on this. Uh, so five hundred to five thousand dollars that uh, legislative chairperson and the county administrator may approve on all equipment purchases up to five thousand dollars. Can't disagree with that. Uh, the second is legislative chairperson under authority as signatory authority on all professional service and public works contracts of $5,000 or more. 
give me an explanation on that. Does that mean that the chairperson may do anything $5,000 or more without going through the committee? The way it reads, that's what it says, because the definition of that signatory authority says that you can do that, sir. It's all I would like is verbiage in there to say that it has, you know, anything over $5,000 has to go through the legislative body. That's all I would ask that be put in there. So that, that is after the legislature has approved the contracts. Uh, when, when, when they bring up a professional service and it's in your resolution packet, the chairman signs. The chairman has to sign all contracts. I know what we both feel that it says, but at any point in time, you can say that you have signatory authority to do it above that because it doesn't say that in here. That's so all I'm asking for. Richie, would it have to be in there? A ruling? I would have to take a look at it uh, in the context of the, uh, the policy. I was out, so I had uh, what page does that refer to? Signatory. I would suggest the table is until we get a, a ruling from Richie because that is a big thing. I'm not saying that you would do that, Mr. Chairman, but I'm saying that somebody could. And that's what I would like to eliminate that, either amended to put in after uh, authority from the legislative body or table it until Richie gives us an answer. It's up to you guys. So, yes. Just the amount that was changed, yes. the word. But it says $5,000 or more, what I'm looking at, okay? It used to say $3,000 or more. It was just the amount. Right. That's all that was changed. And I'm just looking at the way things happen because in the past, you know, the past month, we've seen, well, we don't need to have a vote on that. We don't need it to go for the committee. And I'm just looking to make sure that that doesn't happen. That's all I'm looking for. Well, uh, Legislator uh, Castilla, um, I understand your concern because you're reading only in the authority section. If you refer to page 16, uh, professional services and public works contracts of 5000 or more per year must be approved by the county legislature. And that is also and referenced in the authority. Once the legislature page. approves, then the chairman can sign. Yeah, and that is also referenced in the authorities page under county legislature. The legislature has approval authority by majority vote over all professional services contracts of 5000 or more for all professional services pre qualifications to the budget actions necessary. So upon, so upon reading the whole document, we have clarity. Well, right. you, you expected right. me to read that whole document, and I got it this morning. Okay, sir? So don't say that you need to read the whole document. You put this through in a five minute meeting in there, and then you want to. That is not true. Vote. Mr. Chairman, hold on. Point of order right there. This was actually approved through finance and personnel last Thursday and was put out to the entire legislature. We did not realize that it had to go to the floor with a resolution until Administrator Church told us about it Friday, a couple days ago. A couple days ago. That's why we had a special meeting before legislative session to bring this to the floor. If it did not have to come to this floor, it would have been approved through my committee last Thursday. So the, my understanding was it approved just to, in effect, align it with state law. Correct. Correct. Legislator. Mr. Chairman, just a final point. Um, Perhaps he can't read the whole document in five minutes, but he certainly read some of the document in five minutes right to that particular section. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Chairman, that's 24 favor, zero opposed, and one excuse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Moving now to unfinished business. Any miscellaneous business? Um, quick question, what is the status of the CARES Act money and will we be provided updates on spending and its use soon? CARES Act money? In the ARPA money? Yes. There's actually uh, ongoing discussions about that. We're going through very few projects so far. We certainly will an update you later with that. We do have a little bit of a format. In fact, the task force itself and I are meeting after this meeting to finalize some of this stuff. But regardless of the process, those decisions come back to the legislature through jurisdictional committees. Thank you. Thank you. We would now look for the appropriate uh, motion. Motion, motion, motion. motion. We have a second. Good. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye.
move now to the public comment period. Do we have any speakers? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, would uh, Bill Cahill, or Cahill, come forward? What? Thank you, sir. You have five minutes and get your preparedness. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Bill Cahill. I teach at the Fulton City School District. I'm not here representing them today. I'm here as a taxpayer who happens to have a job that lend some insight to issues that you folks have been debating here for the past few months. Um, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned that uh, I contracted someone to investigate DSS and um, what's going on uh, and how they operate. Um, I don't know who that is. I don't know what you're paying them. Uh, if they come back with anything less than the whole thing needs to be blown up and revamped, I don't think the taxpayers are getting their money. Um, all my comments fall under the umbrella of poverty, right? That's the root of the problem with uh, what DSS has to deal with every day. Uh, most of you read an article maybe on Syracuse.com recently uh, highlighting poverty trends in our county, in our state. Um, we, we have government agencies grow, poverty goes up. We create more agencies, poverty goes up. It keeps going up. Um, as a wise coach once said, if you want to keep getting the same results, by all means, keep doing the same things. If you want different results, you've got to do something different. So where's our, where's our creative thinkers in, in the room? Who's thinking outside the box? When you come into government, there are problems that need to get managed. It's part of your job. But the biggest part of your job is to solve problems. So what's, what's the solution? to solving the problem, or at least get the numbers to go the other way. Instead of going up, get them to go down. Um, the, the biggest problem, and, and I watch the news coverage, uh, I don't see anybody talking about the things they should be talking about. Um, the biggest problem that, that we face is, it's not our local DSS, it's the state of New York. It's their definition of what a safe dwelling is. That is the single biggest problem facing these kids in the Swingo County. You can have no reform that's meaningful whatsoever if that definition doesn't get changed. So maybe you folks need to go down to Albany and make some noise, get into some good trouble, get some attention um, drawn to this. Um, a child sleeping under a coffee table, underneath a coffee table with a towel, you know, that's not a safe dwelling. A child sleeping behind a couch without a blanket or a towel or a pillow, that's not a safe dwelling. Um, if there's feces on the floor in a dwelling and a, and a toddler's in the home, that's not safe. The toddler doesn't know enough to avoid the feces. If there's a teenager in the home under those same conditions, well, that's a safe dwelling because the teenager knows enough to step over the feces. Um, by no means of common sense is this sane. Uh, the bottom line is the New York State minimal standard of care needs to change. Um, I'm, not, I'm not picking on you, Mr. Chairman. I did see on the, on the news some months ago um, talking about funding. Maybe it's not the biggest hurdle uh, that we face here in the county. Um, I would have to uh, respectfully uh, disagree, sir. Um, this, the state has been underfunding. Again, I don't hear anybody talking about Albany. They're not helping you folks. I don't hear anybody complaining about it. They've been under, underfunding DSS for decades. Um, it, it's the caseworkers, and, and I'll just ask our, our elected officials, anybody ever been on a visit with a caseworker, a DSS caseworker? One, I think you all should go. There'd be some more urgency in this chamber. My wife did it for 14 years, sir, as a caseworker. So you know what I'm talking about. 
So they do need more money. They need more access to mental health care. They need, they need more vacation days. I, I would argue they could work a four day week. You have to do something to make that job appealing enough to make people deal with the horrors that they see every day. And apparently only a couple of you in the room have first-hand knowledge of what that is. Um, the second part of the funding is, if you could wave a magic wand, get the state to change that definition of what a safe legal dwelling is, well now you're gonna remove more kids from the home. So where are they going to go? All of the beds in the county, or the state rather, are usually full. I've had kids removed from my classroom, they end up in Buffalo, Saratoga, Albany, as far away as Long Island. Mr. Mitchell might have knowledge of uh, McKinney-Vento transportation laws, which says if the child's removed from a school, if it's remotely possible, you have to provide transportation to get them to their regular school for every school day. Well, now you've got kids that are, have been removed from a traumatic environment, and now they're getting up, they're two hours away, they're getting up at 4 a.m., getting bus to school for a full school day, and then they're getting back to wherever they're beds are at 6 p.m. and they're somehow expected to come to school and function uh, as a regular student. Communication. We teachers love this one. We, we can't tell you because we're protecting you. And what we want, don't want it, you end up in court. We would love to end up in court. We don't want to be protected. We want to protect our students. The caseworkers don't share information with us. I need that information. We don't get to share information with them. They need that information. If we're really gonna service the whole child and give the child the best care they can, everybody's gotta be in the same loop. And it's completely dysfunctional. Um, and I don't fault the caseworkers for that. Um, in conclusion, um, I would say that whoever you've contracted, they need to talk to more than just DSS folks. They should be talking to school teachers. They should be talking to school counselors. They should be talking to school nurses. They should be talking to school psychologists. They should be talking to charge nurses at the hospital who can tell them stories how it's legal in New York State to drop children off on weekends or forever what amount of time they want to drop them off and pick them up days later like pizza. And there's no DSS involved. Hey, we're gonna make you take a drug test where were you? Why'd you drop this kid off? It's just, we, you get better treatment if you're a canine at Canine Group. It's, it's, it's sad. I'm not, I'm not making a joke of it. Um, thank you. So lastly, I would encourage all of you to um, go with Trooper when they do a walkthrough. Um, we have a new visions program. Our high school kids, they do ride-alongs all the time. Why can't we have that for you folks? And go see what these people are dealing with, and I think it would change the conversation in this room dramatically. Thanks very much. I think that just education is going to help. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just to be clear, I'm going to try to limit everybody to five minutes, uh, just in the interest of fairness, and not to get in a back and forth discussion but our uh, charge to the investigative groups is go wherever it takes you. We're not putting anything off of it. Um, having said that, Kelly Hurlden, before we speak, you have five minutes. Tough room. Um, my name is Kelly Hurlbut and I'm a senior caseworker in the Child and Family Services at DSS. When fully staffed, we have 77 full-time caseworkers and one part-time caseworker in Child and Family Services. We currently have roughly 18 openings. A civil <coughs> service test was given in March. Of the 13 people that placed on that list, five have accepted a position for caseworker with a start date of May 31st. Another test is being given in June. When I started my career with the department, we had a lot of services to offer families. Those services have diminished over the years, although the state and federal mandate for our agency have continued to increase. The need for safe and affordable housing in this county is a huge barrier. Families have to sometimes double up with other families, leading to overcrowding situations. 
Families that experience homelessness are placed in one room hotel rooms. Can you imagine that? One room, often with two beds, a small refrigerator, a small microwave, several children, and sometimes the motel might allow animals, plus all of your belongings. Families sit on wait lists for months awaiting mental health services. Once they begin those services, if they miss three appointments for whatever the reason is, they risk being dropped from that service and once again go on a wait list. Our wait list for various services can be as long as eight months. Eight months. That may not seem like a long time, but for our families that do not have their children in their custody, that can seem like a lifetime. Parenting time missed, birthdays missed, Mother's and Father's Day missed, not to mention the various other holidays. Also to mention that the department is tasked with filing a termination of parental rights of children if children remain in an out-of-home placement between 25, or excuse me, 12 and 15 months. When we knock on families' doors, they don't want us there. They don't want to talk to us. We are telling them that someone made a complaint regarding their parenting. We might be involved to monitor court orders. We realize that our involvement creates stress within the family. I would personally love to see a day that we are no longer needed. Our CPS investigators, on average, get 10 or more new families a month to work with. These are there are timelines for paperwork and contacts that must be made. On average, we work 20 business days, and when you put 35 hours into perspective, it's about a day and a half a week to get an abundance of paperwork done and to try to remain in compliance. Our services caseworkers working with families that might have significant safety concerns are carrying case loads around 13. Of those 13, some of those families require visits at multiple homes. Remember, we ask that caseworkers see everyone open on a services case at least twice per month Plus, there are notes to document those contacts, collateral calls to be made, services to refer to, court summaries to write, and the list goes on. Training is ongoing for all of our child welfare staff, no matter how long they have been there. When a caseworker starts, it could take up to six months for them to get their own cases due to the state training requirements. They must learn three different computer systems. For those of you who remember high school or college classes, after the classes ended, you could forget everything you learned. For a caseworker, you are expected to know so much information that must be gathered in any case, every case. We need to know what our regulations are, what our timelines are, typical child development, family court procedures, how to refer to various services, how to de-escalate hostile people, engage with families that don't want our help and don't want to make lasting change. We will never be able to do enough for the families we serve, for the judges that make the ultimate decision, for our communities or for ourselves to feel that we are helping. I had never realized how much I had witnessed in my 13 years on the road until I took my current position. The trauma, the heartache, watching families I work with succeed and fail, but always try my best to give them hope and to try so very hard to leave them in a better place. The families I have worked with will forever be in my heart. This is more than a job for me. This is what I was meant to do to try and help the county that I love. I walk by desks daily where caseworkers are in tears. We show up every day to try and make a difference and give hope. There is hope. Tomorrow is a new day, and as an agency, we will get through it. I believe in our county, and I believe, yes, still after 25 years, that people and systems can change. When I stop believing this, I have always said that I would leave and move on. I'm still here. We strive to do the best we can every day with the resources we have. I will continue to show up every day with a smile on my face because I believe that everyone in my agency makes a difference in people's lives. Yes, we are, aren't appreciated. We are often called horrible names, not thanks, but we are rewarded. We are caring individuals and we know we make a difference. To go off what Mr. Cahill said, I would like to challenge you, our legislators, to take time to shadow us for a day, better yet a week, and see the amount of knowledge that we have and the limitations that we must work with as far as laws, resources, staffing shortage, inadequate services, lack of safe and affordable housing, lack of readily available mental health services, and the abundance of drug issues that we deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shauna Redding. Thank you. Five minutes. I apologize if last I spoke. <clears throat> It came off as my situation only. It was meant to show what the department has done and what they are capable of. Since that can happen to us, it will happen to others. I don't want anyone to feel the pain, the grief, and injustices from those who are meant to protect children. I'm not sorry for speaking the truth. I'm guessing you're tired of hearing about failed responses to Aaron Maxwell and Jordan Brooks. I think it's imperative 
to expound on that. We the public are to trust when we place those calls to CPS that they'll do a thorough job. Recent events that lead to death, the fear is that there will be a lack of people who won't say something when they see something. Fear of no one listening, not being believed, or worse, that a thorough investigation will not be done. Abuse can become more rampant, more than it is right now, and higher risk of death. This sounds cliche, but children are the future. Great things can come from people with rough and humble beginnings. Abuse most often destroys that. Trauma from home life and any additional ones after can last a lifetime. Triggers never fully leave. We all know death destroys a life and whatever potential they had in their future. We need to be able to trust DSS to do their jobs and don't fail to realize what few good caseworkers there are will be lumped into the group of corrupt ones. They will be labeled the same. People will distrust the department more. Families and children need to be able to trust them and many of us have lost that trust. We get CPS needs to stay neutral when dealing with families. It's like picking a jury for trial, unbiased, judging a situation honestly and most of all fairly. That is necessary when a caseworker enters a home. No immediate thoughts of your guilty or thoughts of the parents doing their best like in Jordan's case. I agree with the chairman, innocent until proven guilty. I would like you to think about this first. Think about parenting a moment. Most of us here have raised kids. As parents, we are held accountable to some degree when our child does something wrong, no matter how small. Why? Because we are responsible for that child. It's our responsibility to observe and watch our kids, ensure they make good choices, and discipline them when they don't. Using our parental instincts, when we know something isn't right, we look into it. We teach and guide our children, academically, morally, do chores with good work ethics, and make sure they learn to do it right. We teach them to help and serve others, to be good people, and someday they're on their own. Stacy Elbert is that parent, the top. She oversees the department like a parent with a child. She ensures proper training, moral compass is on, making sure chores, their work is done properly making sure they are helping serve the community by keeping children safe and providing needed services to families. As a parent, we care about other people's children besides our own. We tend to watch over others to make sure they are safe and well cared for, making sure abuse isn't happening and not causing any unnecessary trauma to anyone. Other people's kids are the home CPS investigates. Stacy Albert has the responsibility of watching over the agency and being accountable for mistakes and bad choices DSS makes. Just like a parent who takes some degree of responsibility when their child does something wrong, hold her accountable of what the department does wrong, is contributing and destroying families and lives of innocent children. We know bio parents are the main cause, but CPS and the commissioner were watching over those families. Just like when a serious incident would be a result of irresponsibility of the parent because of failed care to the child, the child is removed and the parent is no longer caring for that child. Therefore, because of failed responsibility in caring for children by CPS, which she is responsible for, it would be fair to remove her, the parent, Stacey Elbert, from having children under her care. If a parent does not take accountability at all, they never get their child back, because whatever they were accused of could happen again. Stacey has not taken accountability, which means this could happen again. Instead, she blames CPS for kids, but doesn't discipline them in the way that they need, like charges on caseworkers for improper conduct, neglect and whatever wrongs made on a case. Holding her accountable does not make her a scapegoat. It's holding her to the standard she chose by the position she decided to take. We know some siblings and families keep and share secrets and sometimes blind to what that person did wrong. They try to prevent that sibling from getting in trouble and face consequences. Why? Because they love them. They try to prevent that sibling from getting, oh I said that, sorry. Because they love them. Some only want to see the good and some can see reality. The, legis the legislator is that sibling. They love Stacey and want to protect her. As we age, we know we have to own up to our own bad choices, neglect and deal with the consequences, the consequences of what we know and didn't know. We know as a parent, if you know something and didn't do anything, it's irresponsible. Same goes if you didn't know something when you should have. Castilla said she needs to be accountable for what she knows and doesn't know, and that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Dale. Thank you. Five minutes, please. In 2018, we admitted everywhere we made some poor choices. 
We did what was necessary to put our kids in a safe place with the family and did everything that was required for us to do. They were about to close their case when they received a false report on us. They did they didn't investigate it truly and removed our child without legitimate cause. They they kept informing us that the goal was to re reunification. The CPS made no real effort to do so. They gave us one visit a week, which is when the counseling, counseling sessions. We didn't get to talk about normal things like school, how her day went, or not playing games or toys with her. They go by what foster mom wants, which foster mom wants was less visits and they visits, which that caused her because she wants to adopt her. CPS has given foster parents more rights than her own parents. Our caseworker keeps telling us that our daughter doesn't want to talk to us, that she doesn't want to see us either, but yet won't let her talk, talk to us herself. That's parental, parental alienation. They are giving the foster mom the ability to break the bond between her family. When you prevent a family from speaking or seeing each other and filling children's heads up with lies and other ideas, they slowly the solely this great relationship. That's not what the best is for the child. The goal is keeping, is kept hearing was reunification. The foster care, the foster care manual even states that the child has the right to call his or her parents. The foster parent does not have the right to discourage it. In fact, foster parents should be encouraging to work on parent-child relationship. CPS continues to assume things without any actual proof. They go off assumptions. You know what you are the first three letters. That's because when you assume there is a possibility of being wrong. The agency continues to portray themselves as they have the best interest of the child. Reality is showing is beneficial the assess. More money that goes to the state federal funds. We have done everything they wanted us to complete, and it's not enough. They take advantage of us and others who have low, low funds, so we can't fight back. They throw our past in our faces and then use them against us. People can change. People will change when their kids come first because they love the kids more. We're tired of them adding lies to reports. We are tired of them keeping our daughter away from us for no reason. We deserve to be treated like normal people and treated with respect. This, they misjudge us and assume the worst. CPS never seems to have any encouraging words. CPS expects pretty and encouragement but won't do it for those who are trying to do their best. We deserve justice for our family and family CPS wrong. Jordan and Galaxy deserve justice. Caseworker needs to be held accountable for not doing their job and breaking the laws. Same with corrupt judges and attorneys. The community deserves caseworkers who want to do their job and do it right. Thank you. Um, thank you. Would Stephanie Stone come forward? Good afternoon, everybody. At the close of the meeting last month, Chairman Witherup made a statement that in this country we are innocent until proven guilty. I do believe this, too. And I also thought we had constitutional rights until CPS entered my life. In America, there's a family court system, system that involves many matters, one being CPS cases, which uses preponderance of evidence as a standard. A report can be made to the state central registry that can find you guilty by using a standard of some credible evidence. This can be used to file petitions against you without your knowledge and you do not have the ability to speak on your behalf. This to me sounds like 
you do not have any constitutional rights when you're battling CPS. This is a fact. I have lived through it. And I question why these standards are okay for parents and caregivers, but not for Commissioner Alfred. The request for her resignation had been brought to the floor and petitions had been signed. However, she has given the chance to be innocent until proven guilty, unlike us who battle CPS. Perhaps the issue of her stepping down should be brought into family court and with their standards, I have no doubt in my mind that she would be found guilty based upon the preponderance of evidence. There is no way that Commissioner Elbert can say that she didn't know what was going on within her department, as I have personally written her several times over this past year. I kept these letters simple, as I feared if I put everything out there, what CPS had done, that they would somehow try to cover it up. I sent her proof that two caseworkers and the director had lied to me. I elaborated on a conversation I had with the director where she threatened me and hung the phone up on me. I also provided her proof that a caseworker submitted documents to the courts that were false. I thought that these examples would have captured her attention. And boy, was I wrong. I never heard from her. Again, she turned a blind eye like she is doing in Jordan Brooks's case. All I wanted was to capture the commissioner's attention and was using these examples as a stepping stone to open the door for someone to sit and go through my case thoroughly. If everything that CPS had done throughout my case was legitimate and they didn't break any laws, then so be it, I would walk away. But there isn't one person who is willing to go through my case and, and review it with me and tell me everything they have done is above board. I'm looking for justice, not only for the death of Jordan Brooks, but for Galaxy Crews and everyone whose lives CPS has ruined. Their false allegations have ruined reputations they have put doubt in medical providers' minds about your ability to care for your child. They have ruined careers. This needs to come to an end. We need justice today. We need to send a message to every employee in DSS, starting with the commissioner, that their games must stop. They must follow the law. They must do their job and protect children and not tear families apart based on their lies, all for financial gain. Today is the day that change needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any, uh, anyone else wishing to speak? Thank you. As we have previously adjourned, this concludes our meeting.